procrastinate much because we don't have classes anymore and we're all sort of getting ready for finals. Um, so I'll start by quickly introducing how this conference came to be. We kept on hearing uh, and like feeling the buzz of the Ethereum blockchain when it was released last summer in July 2016. Uh, we run it by professors like Laura Kurgan uh, and they also expressed curiosity and enthusiasm and that's when we started planning this conference. Um, we were particularly excited about the topic of the blockchain because it impacts students from both real estate and architecture, uh, which coexist at GSAP, but often lack uh, common ground to interrupt them. Uh, so we have the honor to welcome uh, four various speakers at our table tonight. The bios are detailed um, on the handouts, which you might have found on the chairs. Um, and uh, just a side note, they are printed on thermal sensitive paper to celebrate the occasion that this is a very hot topic. <laughs> <laughs> um, so everyone will, like every speaker will speak for about 10 to 15 minutes, um, after which a frame will moderate a discussion uh, in which the audience is invited to participate. During the Q&A, we are going to experiment with a new kind of format uh, we're going to project a Google Doc that uh, you can access if you go to our Twitter, um, A-Frame. It should be posted on it, it should be on, posted on A-Frame's Twitter. The link may or may not be working, but we're working to this. Too. Yeah, it's, it, that's for like in an hour. And so we're going to like type um, like real time as the you know, conversation happens. And you're welcome to like uh, inscribe your questions or like just your own notes or thoughts uh, as it is happening. Um, so, um, our first speaker is um, Mike Golden. So, um, Mike Golden began working on applications for the Ethereum blockchain during the summer of 2015 as an intern at Consensus in Brooklyn. He worked on the smart contract backend for Uzo Music and published two well-received introductions to programmable blockchain titled Just Enough Bitcoin for Ethereum and Ethereum, Bitcoin plus everything. He will be joining Consensus as 
a full-time software developer after graduating from Columbia Disney. Just a side note, because consensus might come up often in the conversation, um, it's a venture production studio building decentralized application on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, our second speaker will be Christian Tossier. Uh, Christian is an IT consultant and P2P entrepreneur. He works on multiple projects for both Fortune 500 and bootstrap startup companies. Christian's main focus today is to explore blockchain-based alternatives to existing systems and business problems. Our third speaker is Suzanne Schindler. Um, Suzanne is an architect and writer focused on the intersection of policy and design in housing. From 2013 to 2016, she was the lead researcher and co-creator of House Housing, an all-timely history of architecture and real estate at Columbia's Temple Hall and Guild Center for the study of American architecture. She has taught at Parsons and TSAP, writes frequently for publications including Places, Urban Omnibus, and Bellwalk, and is currently pursuing a PhD at ETH in Zurich. Uh, our fourth speaker is Christopher Josephson. Uh, Christopher is a mathematician who works at the intersection of social architecture and geometry. Formerly working for Fosters and Partners, he's currently a founding member of BlockApps, a blockchain-based platform for scalable computational architectures. In addition, he runs an experimental co-working space in LA and resides and works in Brooklyn. Uh, Manuel Schwarzberg is unable to join us tonight uh, because he is sick. Um, but um, we will have, uh, I think, a frame replaced in moderating. So let me just tell you a little bit about A-Frame, who organized this event. A-Frame critically investigates the social, economic, and political issues that span the fields of architecture and development. The group is researching the impact of digital technologies on the profession. We aim to establish a collaborative platform to, for young architects to share resources, integrate projects, and engage with alternative forms of practice. So on this note, I think uh, Matt will go on and um, introduce in further detail the blockchain. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so I'm just going to give a little bit of a framework so that we all are on the same page. We're operating under the assumption that nobody in this room knows anything about blockchain. I know there's a lot of people in this room that know a lot about blockchain, but we're going to start from zero, okay? So Mike is going to talk about the future of the internet. Uh, Christian Saussier is going to talk about the historical context and basically real estate applications. Suzanne's going to give us a bit of a reprieve from a lot of the tech and she's going to talk about alternative property developments. Christopher is basically going to delve into some of the hardcore concepts, hopefully, uh, maybe even including decentralized autonomous organizations. Uh, fortunately, Manuel's not going to be here, so we're going to fill in the gaps, and hopefully you guys have enough questions to do that. What am I talking about? What is the blockchain? What is Ethereum? What is the political context? And why should we even care? Why are we doing this at GSAP? Uh, well, we do this. Uh, I want you to keep this in mind. This is a project in Berlin called R50 Baugruppen. And we had a chance to visit this last semester during the GSTEP housing semester. Uh, basically, uh, uh, during housing, we did, did some travel in Berlin. And I show this because let's imagine that everyone in this room pools their resources and decides that they're going to build a building in New York City. And you can imagine all of the constraints that you would basically confront with. The first and most obvious being the real estate industry is very competitive in New York City, and we would probably not get the project off the ground. But let's imagine, because we know that these projects do exist in the real world, and it's, it's part of what we're doing. Okay, So the basic question, the big question here is, how are resources owned, organized, and distributed? What is blockchain? And more accurately, uh, what are blockchains, plural? Uh, <laughs> and again, we're not here to tell you uh, a single definition of the blockchain, uh, nor are we trying to tell you a single application of the blockchain. It's a very political, very contested field of practice right now, uh, but we hope that you mm -hmm. approach this with uh, adequate amount of cynicism, criticism, and uh, curiosity. New York Times basically uh, put it well. The system is complicated enough that even people who know it well don't know how to describe it in plain English. 
and this is an example. The blockchain is a distributed computing architecture where every network node executes and records the same transactions, which are grouped into blocks. Right? Accurate but meaningless. Uh, so basically, <laughs> let me give you some ideas of uh, something to hold on to. The blockchain is not owned by any single person, group, or company. Data cannot be manipulated or censored. It eliminates third-party intermediaries, and it enables ownership of data or personal resources, and it secures transactions without uh, centralized authorities like banks. Uh, to kind of key you into these concepts, there's a big difference between distributed computing and centralized computing. If you've ever downloaded music off of Napster, uh, downloaded something off the Pirate Bay, used Pit, uh, BitTorrent, uh, that's not the blockchain, but you're thinking in the right direction. Centralized computing is uh, large data farms owned by large companies. I'm oversimplifying, but that's the basic concept. Uh, can you smell the blockchain? Can you touch the blockchain? Can you, you know, what is the blockchain? No. So there's this big problem of representation, and there's all the different kinds of ways people are trying to describe it uh, using text and images. Sometimes it's called a decentralized ledger. Sometimes it's called law written in code. Sometimes it's called a world computer. Uh, and sometimes it, uh, it's used to describe <laughs> Web 3.0. And I think this diagram is both funny and <laughs> problematic, uh, but, but at least we can begin to think about the transition between Web 2.0, which is uh, generally where we are now, uh, where we're subjected to the ways other people want us to use the internet, and Web 3.0, where we're leaping into the internet and we're having agency, uh, where we actually have some kind of ownership and uh, authority in what we're doing. And uh, we actually had an interesting debate last night where we couldn't tell if this guy was being, was like jumping into the internet or if he was getting sucked into the internet. <laughs> uh, that, uh, or shredded by the internet. But that's a political kind of question that hopefully will come up at the end. Um, an unstoppable computational machine. What is Ethereum? To understand uh, Ethereum, we have to kind of go back to uh, Bitcoin in some ways. Uh, the blockchain was is basically the operational infrastructure that allows digital currency to be transacted uh, in the Bitcoin sphere. Ethereum is a fundamental kind of evolution of the blockchain that makes it far more advanced and more applicable to our daily lives. Um, Ethereum was launched last summer, and this is part of a larger kind of evolution of these technologies. Ethereum itself has some more phases of development to go, and who knows, in the future, there might even be another application that supplants Ethereum. But this is a, this is a large-scale thing. Uh, in 2013, Vitalik Buterin wrote a white paper introducing the concept. It became implemented, like I said, last summer. And it's live today, so you can see it working if you go onto this network uh, status indicator. And uh, it's up and running. If you don't remember anything about the blockchain, just remember that it, in, it eliminates third parties. It eliminates centralized third parties. And what does that look like? It's basically like cutting out the middleman. And it creates and facilitates what is called a peer-to-peer -peer transaction. So now you can enter into a transaction between you and your friends, a buyer and a seller, a business and a business. What are intermediaries? Basically everything. <laughs> uh, whether it's a social intermediary or if it's a financial intermediary, there's all kinds of uh, intermediaries in our lives. Some are good, some are bad. The point is that everything should be decentralized. Some centralization is good in some cases, uh, but this is to give you a sense of conventional uh, companies right now. And now we have to imagine kind of a time where we're transitioning into another realm of applications defined by decentralization. And these are some of those applications. They're just being built now. Some are just in prototype phase. Uh, some have integrated with large-scale companies, Fortune 500 companies, large banks. They're all picking up on this technology. This is no small thing. These are some projects that are currently operating in the architecture and real estate space. It's a very new concept, and these projects are just launching. They're all very exciting. What is the political context? Uh, we all know these companies, Uber and Airbnb, uh, often cited as uh, the sharing economy. But the misconception here is that there's really no sharing going on. What they're basically doing is attaching themselves to uh, your resources, your car or your home, and they're making a profit off of it as a middleman. So Uber is the ultimate middleman in the transaction, and they're making a lot of money doing so. It's very political. You may have known about or seen the protests in France recently. Uh, taxi drivers or 
Uber drivers, are they employees of Uber? Uh, Uber obviously doesn't want to think so because their business model is basically built off the autonomous vehicle, which is uh, soon to roll out. Uh, Airbnb, uh, less obviously uh, malicious, but, but uh, if we think in terms of a, a little deeper critique, they have basically... Uh, they've basically taken our domestic space, our most private space, and turned it into something that is a profitable commodity. An example of a decentralized application is Lazuz. Uh, I believe they're out of Israel. And they're doing exactly, the, providing the exact same service that Uber is, but they're doing it decentrally on the blockchain. And they're cutting out the middleman. And the way that these decentralized applications are able to function is they are written into something called a smart contract, which we'll define later, and they're verified on the blockchain. So that's how you can know that you're actually going to get paid for this transaction. Similarly, Slock is moving into the space of Airbnb. They're not a direct competitor, but they're providing all kinds of property sharing tools uh, so you can rent your bike, rent your apartment, rent your house, anything, anything, any kind of personal property. And again, the same model. In this case, uh, for instance, you pay uh, some of their hardware that they're building, and uh, you pay a transaction, basically, and that space becomes available to you um, for whatever period of time you write into the smart contract. So the smart lock is part of uh, the Internet of Things, these embedded computational devices like Nest, which is a frequently cited example. Uh, there's a lot of politics here, too. Google basically knows uh, what you're doing. Uh, when you get a status update on your phone, uh, it's not Nest, it's Google. And this kind of Internet of Things scales from uh, the Samsung TV to the smart city. So it has, it has global reach and it has ultimate scale. And the big question here is our lives and what we do on the Internet, it, while we may think it's meaningless and trivial or mundane, is actually very, very profitable and very useful to all kinds of companies. So uh, that said, why should we all care? Uh, this we're in working in the, in the context of architecture, real estate, and development. Uh, land titles and property deeds will probably be the first application of blockchain in real estate. Uh, the deed is an archaic system, and it's prone to all kinds of inefficiencies and and uh, even corruptions. There's a lot of exploitation that happens uh, through this inefficient system. If you put these systems on the blockchain, uh, they can be secured. Uh, without inefficient uh, intermediaries. And what we do is we take a huge leap uh, into the 21st century where a building or a space or a property can have its own digital identity. And a building, for example, can, can track its changes. You can know all kinds of information about it, which, which makes the, the buying process much easier. Uh, and all kinds of there's all and there's all kinds of design implications of this. Uh, shared ownership and group design build these concepts have existed forever, but the blockchain has all kinds of additional incentives um, for people to gather their resources, secure those resources, and work together on common projects. Uh, a lot of those uh, forms of collaboration will be managed through distributed governance, and these are features that allow large groups of people who don't currently trust or know one another to have trust in one another. So I don't know some of you, but through the system, I could trust you. So we return to the basic question uh, that, we're, that we're thinking about tonight. How are resources owned, organized, and distributed? And how, how does the system production affect the outcome of design? That's a kind of an obvious thing that happens in the production of buildings, but it's not something we often consider as part of the design process. And we should kind of position blockchain as one of many tools that we can use uh, to kind of design these systems. And for that, from that, I'll turn it over to Mike. Okay. Hi, everybody. Nice to meet you all. I'm Mike. Um, so let's talk about what the internet might look like 10 years from now. Uh, so we don't think about a lot of the interactions that we have with internet services and systems today because we've just become rather used to the way that things work. Uh, the web itself is no longer the miracle that it once was. It's very mundane to watch a video on the internet. You 
can play an online video game on a remote mountaintop, and that's boring. Um, we also don't think about it as mundane and expected so much so as to be unconscious that we have these things called accounts on the internet. And what's interesting about that is that accounts are so much more prevalent in the online world than they are in the offline world. I don't have an account at my bodega. I don't have an account at the movie theater. I don't have an account with my friends. I didn't need an account to meet Matt at a party and be invited to speak here tonight. But we have accounts everywhere on the internet. Facebook, Google, and 300 others. Um, we also don't think any of the fact, anything of the fact that these accounts know nothing about one another. My Facebook account knows nothing about my Amazon account, and neither of them know anything about my Columbia University ID. We just expect that. That's very normal. That's the way the internet has always worked for as long as we have all used it. So as a result of this, I have like 300 separate identities uh, on the internet. Uh, and what's kind of weird also is that every single one of those identities is ultimately controlled and mediated by somebody who is not accountable to me. Facebook could change my profile picture. Twitter could tweet on my behalf. LinkedIn could say I went to Cornell. The New York Stock Exchange could halt trading at any time. And in that case, they actually do. So these are not catastrophic problems, but the fundamental issue that we need to trust entities which are not accountable to us on the internet has actually put a huge check uh, on, a, on an entire dimension of what it's theoretically possible to do with the internet. So we're not doing things where this kind of unilateral administrative action would be truly consequential because we would be foolish to attempt it given the fundamental limitations at play. So when you think about it, these fundamental limitations, they've forced us into these annoying and unnatural schemas like having distinct identities between mundane services that we're not even trying to be secretive about. And because we're used to all this, we're so used to it, we haven't even considered what we might do if things were different. So what I'm going to talk about uh, are two ways that the internet is fundamentally changing right now thanks to a technology called blockchains. Uh, this new internet, if you will, uh, is arguably the most substantive advance in networked applications since the web itself. We are about to make a jump that big and of that great consequence. So the two topics I'm going to cover, uh, the things that will change a lot in the next 10 years, are identity and trust on the internet. So let's start with identity. So Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Clout, the US government, 500 other companies you've never heard of, 498 of them are advertisers, all of these companies uh, they want to be the centralized point of trust uh, through which your identity is verified. And this hasn't worked because, frankly, nobody is so submissive as to surrender control of something so important as their identity uh, to something like a private company. And this isn't just a political thing. There are practical consequences if somebody pulls the plug on a data center in California and I disappear, bureaucratically speaking. Um, that's like, you know, there are real consequences to that. Uh, we also can't really trust governments. It's not super smart to trust governments simply because uh, I don't know who's going to be president 20 years from now. I don't know what kind of virulent anti-me sentiment will be coursing through American democracy then. I like to say that in 1918, no German would have predicted Hitler to be a little tragic about it. Um, but I don't want the government to be able to target me for anything, so we can't really trust them either. So to date, a solution for this, uh, for establishing meaningful identities on the internet has been precluded because everything devolves to servers. Servers which somebody owns, somebody pays for, and which they have ultimate control over. And this alone is incompatible with what we understand identities to be. Identities are free, and I mean that both as in freedom and as in beer. Richard Stallman famously said that free software meant free as in freedom, not as in beer, but identities are actually free in both senses. I have paid nothing to stand before you all and endear myself to you as a somewhat starry-eyed software developer. That's free as in beer. Uh, furthermore, I am the only person who can alter your perception of me, and I do it by changing my behavior. That's free as in freedom. There has been no way to replicate this on the internet. By the way, what is an identity? Uh, we have to be able to define it super abstractly or else we fail. We can't say that an identity is these three fields with values in such a range. Uh, and that's largely because you can't fit prints into that. And frankly, it wouldn't really make a difference if we had uh, 1,000 uh, fields. It's not a matter of scale. We have to think about this in such a way. We need a solution that is, ag that is totally agnostic to what an identity is, and in fact has to support multiple possible definitions of an identity simultaneously. So we answer that question uh, with what's called public key cryptography. So now I'm going to get into how we actually start to solve uh, this identity problem. So on blockchains such as the Bitcoin blockchain, uh, which was the very first blockchain and it's used for exchanging a currency, 
Identity is defined using public-private key cryptography. This mechanism for identity management is so powerful that it is used as the linchpin of a system, Bitcoin, which secures upwards of $6 billion US dollars in value today. A dollar bill, a paper dollar bill, is mine because I hold it in my hand. Dollars in my Bank of America account are mine because Bank of America has not yet lost them on my behalf. <laughs> a Bitcoin is mine because I possess the private key in a public-private key pair to which they are attributed by every other user of the Bitcoin blockchain. To steal my Bitcoins, you would have to either steal and decrypt my private key, which would take thousands of years, or you could try to generate my private key by chance, which would similarly take thousands of years. So I have the same agency in controlling my Bitcoins that I do controlling my cash in that I'm responsible for holding on to my wallet. But theft of my wallet is de-incentivized because it's encrypted anyway. And unlike a physical wallet, I can have backups of my Bitcoin wallet. So if I do somehow lose it and you find it, because it's encrypted, you have nothing and I haven't actually lost anything. So public-private key cryptography becomes an incredibly powerful tool for identity when we open the scope of what we may associate with a key pair from sums of money to, well, anything. Why not? Absolutely anything. Uh, in the future, we'll say that a given key pair is associated with this Facebook account, this Twitter account, uh, a credit score, a job at this company, which itself has an identity associated with a tax ID number, trust ratings from customers, so on and so forth. This uh, probably maybe sounds like a nightmare for privacy. Um, in fact, with blockchains, we can blow privacy out of the water uh, relative to what we can do today. I don't have time to talk about it right now, but ask me later. So, public-private key cryptography uh, is exceptionally powerful. It's been around for a long time. Public-private key cryptography itself is not actually new. Uh, it's what allows us to connect to websites and know that we're connecting to the real deal using HTTPS. We can detect man-in-the-middle attacks. We can have encrypted conversations with our friends and know that we're actually talking to our friends and not someone else. But we're missing a key component that will enable us to make real interesting use of these identities. And that's a public reputation system, or perhaps a system of reputation systems. And a reputation system is a system of attributions and attestations about a given identity. So Yelp is a reputation system for businesses, but it's centralized. It is censorable. Uh, it is subject to manipulation because somebody owns it. We need decentralized infrastructure to run a reputation system on if it's going to be truly meaningful. Otherwise, we've just wound up with yet another unaccountable server owner uh, acting as an intermediary or gatekeeper who will inevitably find a way to capture our identities and sell them back to us. Uh, Yelp sells top listings for search results to whoever has the cash, not, who, not, to whom is whoever, not to whom is most reputable necessarily. And that is unacceptable for something as important as our identities. So we've talked about how we can use public-private key cryptography to establish identities for ourselves on the internet, uh, but we're missing this, this important thing. We need decentralized infrastructure to run this identity system. And this is where trustless computing comes in, uh, and trustless computing we solve with blockchains. So let's say we live in a world uh, where everybody has good facility with public-private key identity. And this is actually already happening. You don't realize it, but just like email has kind of, you know what email is, it's penetrated your life. Uh, Public-private key cryptography is slowly like working its way into your brains right now. So let's say, that, uh, let's say that we live in a world where it's very mundane. So one application for this you might come up with is online voting because it seems to resolve the, the online voter fraud problem pretty perfectly. We just have to trust Uncle Sam to maintain a database of key pairs and to count the votes properly. One person, one vote. Uncle Sam can prove that one vote is attributed to only one person by having them sign a vote using their private key and then verifying it using the public key. The problem is, of course, we have to trust Uncle Sam. Uh, and it's worse than that, we have to trust Uncle Sam's software. And if you ever talk to a defense contractor, uh, you probably don't want to trust government software. Um, so voter fraud and electoral misconduct, you've been following the primaries this season. Even with our friends and neighbors counting the votes, like we don't trust what's going on uh, behind the scenes when stuff gets counted, we're never going to trust software to do it. And furthermore, at a technical level, there is no way that if we were sending even cryptographically sealed votes to a server controlled by Uncle Sam, if it's not, if it's not public, if it's controlled by the government, uh, there's just no way that we, can, that we can verify that votes are being tallied correctly. So we would be right to be skeptical about that sort of thing. So this is where blockchains come in, specifically what are, what are called programmable blockchains. So here's the, here's the key definition if you were studying for an exam. 
Programmable blockchains enable the provisioning of autonomous, transparent, and auditable software. They preclude the possibility, mathematically, of interference not specified explicitly in their code. They do not run on servers. If they ran on servers, this would be unacceptable. These systems run on public infrastructure, which is the blockchain itself. Uh, the blockchain is a distributed system. It's distributed over thousands, millions, or billions of CPUs. Anyone can participate. It is completely unprivileged, and users are compensated by the network for participating in the network. That's mining, which you may have heard of, but we won't get into that. What participation means is to run software that works to audit or validate code being executed on the network. Everybody sees the same transactions, they run it against the same code, and they should get the same results. If anybody tries to fudge something, they'll need to be in conspiracy with 51% or more of other participants in the network to pass it off as legitimate. This is called a 51% attack. So you can think about a blockchain as an open world computer that everybody shares. It's one computer that we all use. Uh, we can all audit it and trust it equally. So these autonomous software agents which run on blockchains are called smart contracts. And a smart contract, this is the missing piece uh, that we need to allow us to vote on the internet without having to trust Uncle Sam or anybody else. So how would this work? Uh, so the US Federal Election Commission, they're gonna publish a smart contract on the blockchain for electing the next president. Uh, we don't need to trust them though. Um, like it's not a problem that it comes from them because we're going to verify, we're going to validate uh, that this smart contract actually does what they say it's going to do, which is count votes fairly. Uh, so we'll see that they, that they have uh, published a contract. Um, and that contract gets an address. The address is a deterministic function of the publisher, its contents, and a unique value called a nonce, which is some technical nonsense you don't need to care about. Because blockchain is a decentralized technology, I can pull up this code on my own laptop, you can pull it up on yours, uh, and we can have confidence that we're looking at the same thing. Now we don't go through a centralized server to do this. We are participants, we are validators, in this distributed system. So we have complete confidence that when we pull this up separately on our own computers, we're seeing the same thing. If every node on the network does not have a copy, in a sense, the thing doesn't exist at all. If you're not doing everything, anything fishy, everyone will get a copy. Uh, if you are doing something fishy, you'll need to control 51% of the network to fool us. And by the way, controlling 51% of the network, um, that turns out to be a hard thing to do. If you can figure out how to do that, there's six billion bitcoins waiting for you to own. So, we look at the code present in the address in question, and this will be machine code. Uh, this is hard to read, theoretically we could, now, now we can audit this, we can decompile this, it would be nasty. Uh, what would be preferable as if, is, would be if the FEC published their source code. This is not election code, this is just some random code. So what we do, the FEC, the FEC publishes their source code, uh, we audit it, we compile it, and we just make sure that the byte code, the machine code, which comes out of our compiler, is the same code at the address on the blockchain that the FEC published. So if we can audit this code and say, okay, yes, this is doing what the FEC, FEC says it's doing, we just compile it, and if the byte code matches, we're good to go. Now, obviously, not everyone is a computer programmer. Uh, even if you have the source code, you might not be able to audit the contract code yourself. Um, but because we have a strong identity system and a blockchain for trustless computing, this means that we can have an open public reputation system for this sort of thing. So if the most well-respected contract auditors deem this code at a particular address to be legit, people will submit votes to it. And without a reputation system, the way this works is people would just go on CNN and they would talk about it. That's just like the, the old world analog. Um, we're just going to make that a little more rational uh, with a reputation system since any fast talker you get on CNN these days. So how do we tell who is a US citizen eligible to vote? Just to sort of walk you through a, another little uh, case here that you might not have considered. So we use something called a registry and we use it in conjunction with a reputation system. So this is gonna, I don't know, maybe it'll blow your mind, we'll see. So the contract should only pass an audit if it exclusively accepts votes from identities registered as US citizens by identities registered as licensed obstetricians, by identities attested to as reputable medical schools by potentially just us, potentially just normal people. The trust chain could end there. It could end in some special committee which you know, people vote on in some way. But these trust chains can always end in normal people, people like you and I. And people like you and I, we have trustworthiness on the basis of what we say about one another. So this is perhaps the hardest thing to wrap your head around, but it's like really it's the way the world works. Like if someone recommends me a bar, if a friend recommends me a bar, they have cachet with me, so I might check it out. If in the past they've given me crappy recommendations, I might not check it out. 
uh, why is a Columbia University degree worth more than some other degrees? As someone who's gone to two schools, I'll tell you there's really no great reason, uh, but it has a good reputation. Um, <laughs> people think highly of it, and that's, that, you know, that means something. Like, we just have thoughts about things, and that's reputation, and it means something to us. Why do Supreme Court justices wear black robes and work in a building that looks like God's house? It's to help you respect them. Not every country has a Supreme Court that is respected by its population. Ours does, you know, pretty well. Uh, among, among all of us. Um, but the, the point is, like, these things that are important to us, that matter in our lives, it boils down to what we think about them. Like, the Supreme Court, we listen to it because we have some amount of respect for it. Also, they have some power. But So really, this is the way the world works. It's just never something that we've been able to port onto the internet before. And now that we can, now that we can put this on, on the internet, we can scale it in ways which are unprecedented. And that's the kind of tough thing to wrap your head around. That is the big thing that you should take away from this. So the web brought information to every corner of the earth. What blockchains will do is bring trust to every corner of the earth. That, in my opinion, is the big thing about blockchains. That's the world-changing thing about them. That's what's going to allow us to do interesting things that have not been possible before. It has never been possible before to use the internet as a trust engine. So just to resolve this, our, our little thing about voting, so everybody votes, the contract expires at some predetermined point, and then the winning candidate is going to be transparently visible to anyone participating in the blockchain, and there will be no hanging chads. Now in the future, we might set this up such that upon the expiration of the election, of the election contract, the private keys controlling the nuclear weapons and whatnot will be automatically transferred to the winner, to the identity of the winner. Uh, who, who wins the election and the outgoing president would find their private keys are no longer good to unlock the White House. Uh, smart contracts can be of arbitrary complexity, so you could think of any crazy scheme you want for, for how you might want to make this work if you're designing the FEC's election contract. So, I'm a lot of time, uh, but hopefully I've got you thinking a little bit about how blockchains work. Uh, the folks who talk next are going to talk about some more domain-specific stuff for all you architecture, design, real estate folks, and I appreciate your time. My name is uh, Christian Saucier, uh, French-Canadian, so you'll have to get used to my accent over the next uh, 15 minutes. Speaking of which, I'll start a little timer here to make sure I don't go too much overboard. Um, thank you for an excellent, I mean, all the, the complex technical basis has been, uh, has been put down now for me, so it's going to be uh, easier for me to talk about how we can apply some of this to, um, to the real estate and to uh, land management and property uh, transactions. Uh, the company that I work for, Ubiquity, that's our specialty. We are a uh, company that is building a blockchain uh, system, blockchain-based system, if you will. We're using blockchain technology in order to work with a number of players within the real estate deeds and title transaction process in order to facilitate that process, reduce costs, reduce the time, and increase the confidence. You know, we're going to talk about trust as well, in, uh, in, in, in that the process is happening as we want it to happen. Um, before I go further, I'm just going to need a show of hands. Uh, is everyone done with their final exam? I understand this was a big week. Who, who else still has exams going on? OK, all right. I'll forgive you. I won't ask you guys to come up here and describe blockchain. Who else could describe blockchain now? Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's it's hard, right? I mean, you know, we we we've had two people so far talk about blockchain, and uh, I work with about you know, with blockchains on a day to day basis. And uh, as you mentioned earlier, yeah, uh, the experts. It, it's really really hard to make really the impact of of what this technology can do. So I'm going to try to reiterate a little bit of what you've had and you know, you've heard so far and bring that to, um, to something that is relevant to you know, my business in the real estate world. Uh, who's familiar with what this is? Mainframe computer. This is a pretty modern one. Uh, Blue Jean, I believe, from IBM. 
Uh, there's probably one of those on the campus here somewhere. Uh, mainframe computers have been around since, what, the 60s, late 60s and uh, 70s. Uh, they're still around, right? You know, your, your banks and, and, and lots of large institutions still rely on this technology to host some of their most precious uh, information. Data like, you know, the, the New York Stock Exchange and, 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 and the, the, the Royal Bank of Canada and large institutions that hold very valuable data, uh, they hold a lot of that on these kind of computers. They're centralized, they're in special room behind special doors with special guards, and it's really, really hard to get to one of these. Uh, but they're in one room with one door and one guard in one place, right? All of that data, while it might be backed up some other place around the world, it still resides on this one central uh, system. We've been doing this, as I said, since the you know, late 60s, 70s, so this is old technology that's been around for a long time, and we've just been you know, incrementally improving it over, over the years. And then in the 19, late 70s and 1980s, something else happened. The personal computer, right? Everyone's got a personal computer nowadays, and what was the Bill Gates quote at the time? You know, oh, no one will ever need more than uh, 640 was it kilobyte <laughs> of, of, of RAM on their computer, right? Th there was a revolution where suddenly some of the smarts were taken out of the server room and brought on your desk. And your desk computer now had some of the information and some of the processing. So suddenly you could do things like a spreadsheet and calculate locally, you know, like kind of a scrapbook, you know, how, how to do something and then send whatever results to a server that was owned by the company or, or whatever. And suddenly that company didn't just have one big server in New York City in the basement of the building. No, every floor of, of the organization, every department of the uni university had its own server with specialized applications for whatever purposes, you know, the, the servers dedicated to. So we had suddenly decentralized, and we're gonna head towards blockchain here, we had suddenly decentralized the processing and the storage and the control of the information that is being used for whatever business process is at play. And then what happened? The internet. With the internet, suddenly we took these servers that sat in this department, that department, and that faculty over there, and we took these computers and we just spread them all around the internet. And now you've got companies all around the world who actually host information, and you use that, that, that same personal computer that you've had now for, for many decades on your, on your desktop, you use that to access information, not just from your local you know, department, but from anywhere around the world. So suddenly the information had further decentralized. You were even more empowered as an individu individual user in the network by being able to get out there not just to the company that provided you access to the network like CompuServe or, or whatever. Now suddenly you could get out beyond the borders of you know, your, your, your immediate infrastructure and connect with anybody anywhere around the world. The amount of um, power and, and personal control that was gained in that process from centralized mainframes to client server infrastructure and to now in the you know, 1990s and 2000s, the World Wide Web, the amount of individual liberty and individual control that you have over your information and, and information that you're able to get from your, your, your computing infrastructure has grown exponentially. Right? right now on this phone, I can access Wikipedia, which has you know, the best library ever invented by mankind. Uh, you can access specialized application for your field of expertise. You can network with the best in the field of whatever you do. So suddenly that becomes a very empowering tool that we all can use to become better individuals, professionals, uh, players, and, 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 and so it's good for entertainment, it's good for professionalism, it's, it, it's good for all of us, right? We all benefit from the fact that we are all individually more empowered by this computing uh, infrastructure. The latest evolution of all this, this empowerment, if you will, that, that has been brought to us by information technology is cloud computing. So now, even though my phone here is not as powerful as this computer to, to process information and whatnot, 
I don't really care because now with cloud computing from my phone I can access not just my data but also the processing power you know owned by Amazon or Google or someone okay? and, and now we can share that information across even you know devices that have very radically different level of computing power <laughs> cloud computing kind of homogenizes all of that and allows us to uh, whether we have a very expensive computer or a very cheap piece of networking component we're still able to do some some pretty complex interactions I can run a spreadsheet on that phone. Of course, this phone is pretty good. But you know, even if you have a, a relatively cheap and low-end computer, you can connect to your Google spreadsheet something on the cloud and actually do some pretty sophisticated you know, computing you know, on, on, that, uh, on that technology. And now we're getting to blockchain. Blockchain, if you look at the, at the, uh, at the steps that we've talked about, from the 70s to the 80s, you know, when we moved away from centralized to client-server, from the 80s to the 90s and the 2000s, when we move away from client-server and really, and when I say move away, all of the past still exists. We still have client-server solutions, we still have mainframes, but, but there's, there's new technology that come and, and uh, you know, supplement, if you will, you know, some of the basic uh, infrastructure that, that, that still exists in, since the 70s. Uh, Today, the, the latest evolution or the latest jump, if you will, in, in, in this is, is this blockchain technology we're talking about today. What blockchain will do to our ability to interact with one another through the trust network, through the identity, you know, being able to prove the identity of one another you know, on, on this network, which is not something we're able to do today. What blockchain will allow us to do over the next 5, 10, and 15 years will be as radical as what the web has allowed us to do compared to prior to the web. If you go back to 1992 and you've got a great idea uh, for, for, for that you want to share with the world, that was pretty hard, right? You need to call CNN or the Wall Street Journal or someone that has people's eyeballs and, and someone that can publish your information. If you're a singer, you need to go to the distribution networks. If you're a movie maker, if you're an artist, if you're whatever you do, you are looking at these vast and large companies uh, or, or channels, let's call them, uh, of, you know, in order to distribute your information. The web has, has transformed that, right? You've seen a lot of these large companies, some of them have fallen, who went, out of, who went bankrupt just uh, this week, uh, Sports Authority, I think, in Florida. It's a you know, brick and mortar, it's been popular for many, many years. Uh, they were killed by Amazon. You know, you, you, it's cheaper and easier to go buy your sport hockey stick or whatever Sports Authority sold uh, than, than, than driving down the road and going to Sports Authority. And they just couldn't adapt and they haven't survived the transition from you know old centralized to web-based you know purchasing online. Um, same thing will happen with this blockchain technology. It is as important and as transformative as what we've seen in the past. And a way to exemplify that or illustrate that, maybe I should stay close to the microphone. Uh, you see there the centralized server. That's your mainframe, right? That's how a lot of us think of, and still how a lot of our processes today operate. If I write you a check that says one million dollar and I give it to you, check me out, do I look like I've got one million dollar in my bank account? Probably don't, right? So you're not sure. So what are you going to do? You're going to go to my bank, the central authority that's going to clear that check, right? And you're going to call them up saying, hey, I got a check here from this dude before I give him whatever he's buying for a million bucks. Can you validate whether account number one, two, three has a million bucks, right? So the bank is the authority. The bank is the person that we all trust. And if the bank says yes, then yeah, we're happy. And when the bank says no, not really, uh, then, then, then we're not happy. But that all resides on us trusting that bank or trusting the U.S. government to validate you know, the, the, the votes that you, that you give them. And then we move to more decentralized network. The decentralized there, that's very similar to what we have today with the web. When you saw all the list of the various identities that you have online, you don't have one. You don't, you don't only have one, right? You have one with Google. You have one with Facebook. 
you know, LinkedIn and all the myriads of various companies out there. And, and of course, these companies are working really hard at trying to link these identities together in order to derive even more, you know, consumer patterns and behavior, you know, from, from you. But it's much more of a decentralized system where you still have central hubs of information and central hubs of, of, uh, of power or authority, but, but there's multiple of them, right? And, and so it's distributed a little bit. And as we saw, the web has really transformed how we interact with the world around us. So whereas originally you had to go to the New York Times in order to publish an opinion if you wanted a lot of people to, to view your opinion about something, now you can start a blog, right? And, and there's multiple places where you can start a blog. You could have a Facebook account, you can have whatever other accounts out there. And suddenly you're empowered individually by being able to reach out to more people. Now, of course, it's, it's hard to get noticed on the web, right? It doesn't change any of the reputation that you might need in order to attract attention. But still, with the web, you have a chance that your article will go viral. And when it does, certainly the whole network you know, starts noticing and, and your chance of having an impact in the world, whether it's through article or art or, or whatever it is that you do, is much greater in a decentralized network where you have different points of power that you can use in order to influence the, the community around you. Bitcoin, Ethereum, blockchains, all of these technical terms, those are distributed network. Suddenly, when you look at a distributed network, there is no single point of power. My phone runs a client. Your computer runs a client. Her computer over there runs a client. And all of our computers are in exchanging information together. The server is a little bit here, a little bit there, and a bit over there as well. And together, the way the code is implemented on this blockchain architecture allows all of our devices to synchronize with one another and agree on a state of truth. So instead of you having to call my bank asking, hey Christian, or hey banker, does Christian have a million bucks in his bank account? Now your computer is able to talk to her computer and check if she has any records proving <clears throat> there goes my centralized phone. <laughs> Proving that, uh, that, that I have a million bucks or not in my bank account. Uh, so this distributed network agrees on one state of truth. And that is a fundamental change, as we've seen earlier, in how computing happens, in how we engineer IT systems. And... As you can see, IT systems have a lot of influence on our lives today. It will impact whatever it is that you do, you know, professionally and personally, as a career or as, as, a, as an individual, whatever you do over the next 5, 10, and 15 years, and definitely if we're talking about architecture and design and, and, and systems that you build that will last hundreds of years, right? I mean, they, they will outlast any government, they will outlast any bank. You know, this building here has been, I don't even know how long it's been around, but, you know, these stay for generations and generations. A distributed network, as long as we have power in the internet, these networks don't go down. They cannot go down. Over there, you just shut down the, the point in the middle, and suddenly everybody is naked and wondering what to do. In a decentralized network, Sure, you gotta attack multiple points, but but still, you can you can figure out you know a couple of pain points and shut down you know the efficiency and the efficacy of that network. On a distributed network, unless you shut everybody down, and obviously these are global networks, so it's happening in China, it's happening in Australia, in Africa, in North America, and everywhere. So unless you shut the whole network down, this network continues to talk with one another. So very very resilient system. Many companies are using this. You might not be familiar with a lot of these icons right now, but you will be in, <laughs> in the near future. Uh, Ubiquity, that's my company over there. Ethereum, this is the blockchain that we're talking about tonight. It's a very, very flexible uh, you know, uh, computing architecture that will allow us to build these systems that will transform your lives. Storage, that's an example of a company that uses this kind of decentralized network in order to share storage on your, on your hard drive. I have storage on my phone, there's storage on this computer. 
you can put that storage to use and, and share it with other people. So other people can share inform, save information on your hard drive at a cost and you get paid for that. Just like Dropbox, you pay Dropbox to store information there. Well, with storage, it's, it's tens of thousands of computers around the world who get paid like a little bit of money in order, to, in order for you to be able to save your information in a distributed or decentralized network across you know, hundreds or thousands of computers around the world. So if, if, if Dropbox gets shut down for some various, you know, Dropbox is found to have child pornography or something and the government goes in and says, all right, you gotta shut down these servers right now, then we're all out, right? With a system like this, it doesn't solve the child pornography problem, but the network cannot go down unless you shut down the entire internet, essentially. Um, Bitcoin is probably you know, one of the most common terms that you might have heard before coming here. BitTorrent is also probably something that you've been exposed to. BitTorrent's got like, yay, you, know, you can copy you know, fake you know, illegal movies. Uh, so a lot of people think that, you know, that is used for uh, just bad things. But no, BitTorrent is used by Microsoft and all sorts of companies out there in order to, um, in order to share information. All right, let's apply this to real estate. Uh, real estate is a complex process. When you transfer and when you record title changes and deeds against a, a title, there's a lot of people involved. We have a lot of history around real estate that involve a bunch of players who essentially need to trust one another. And we have all these archaic systems, paper-based systems where you know, we sign this piece of paper, you go meet with the, the attorney, and you, the attorney sends the paper to the buyer and the seller, and, and the whole process takes a long time. It involves a lot of people. It is very costly. And as we saw earlier, there's a lot of middlemen. There's a lot of agents involved in, in this. What blockchain can do is create what we call a smart asset, a smart token on one of these blockchains that, uh, that represents the property that you're wanting to transact. And certainly all the players who are wanting to be party in, the, in that transaction or need to be party in that transaction can interact with a central engine, a central entity, that smart asset on the blockchain, but the smart asset is, is decentralized across mm -hmm. the entire world. So all the players have one source of truth. We all agree on the current state of the system without having to have one attorney or one bank or one central agent that controls everything. So when you look at the history of a building or a piece of property over time, which, which you know, brings that complexity even higher. Is, is there a clean title over this house? It's hard to tell. Sometimes you gotta go look in very, very old books. What the blockchain allows you to do is record information about this property over a period of time in such a way that is provable. Yes, this company did a title search on this date and their findings was that the, t the title was clear. And once that is signed and, and secured on a blockchain, 20, 30, 40 years later, someone can witness that signature, validate that it's true, without having to travel to you know, some county office somewhere and digging up old dusty books. It is all available to anyone online to be able to publicly view that the information was recorded, was recorded accurately, and was signed by an entity that, you know, if we have good uh, reputation, if it has a good reputation that you will, you, you will trust on the blockchain. So just in conclusion, what that means to your particular uh, business and, and, and what you're wanting to do with your degrees and your careers, uh, it's yet to be known. We don't know that, right? We are like the web in 1996 right now. It's a great technology. We know it's transformative. Understanding it is the first step. And in 1996, no one could have imagined what the web was going to become in 2016, 20 years later. Uh, just like this, no one understands yet, not me, not anybody else in this room, how big this technology can be. All we know is that it has the same transformative power that the web has. You know, or at least some of the same attributes that you know, we saw with the web, and, 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 and it's happening right now. So get involved, ask us questions after this, uh, come see other conventions and ask questions about it, because one thing you can be sure, 
that this technology will change your life. Hi, everyone. I'm going to talk about a model that's uh, probably about 100 years old. So <laughs> looking forward to bridging the forward looking with uh, um, a backward looking. Um, I was asked to talk about alternative development models. Uh, because this is an, an old model, I'm going to be talking about, I've stuck, stuck, stuck away from alternative. It's actually a very conventional model, but it's been much underused. I'm talking about nonprofit cooperatives, which you could say it's a form of, form of crowdsourcing for real estate development. Um, four things I'm going to address. What is nonprofit cooperative housing? There's also other words for it in, in this country. It's often called limited equity co-ops. I'm going to look at two recent examples um, built in Zurich, Switzerland. Then the question, why does it work there? Why doesn't it work here? And what about community land trusts? And what about Baugruppen, which um, we saw in the um, introductory presentation by Matt. So what is nonprofit cooperative housing? Did I just skip something? No. Um, as you can see from this 1968 ad, uh, one of the biggest developers here in New York City of nonprofit co-ops was a federation of nonprofit organizations established to promote better housing at lower cost. Sounds pretty good, no? Why aren't we doing it now? <laughs> um, Brief four-point summary. What what are they? So cooperatives. Remember, it's, it was the only legal form of multifamily home ownership in the United States before the condominium was introduced in 1961. So the con the difference between a co cooperative and condominium is that a cooperative is a shareholder model, where everybody owns a share and has a right to an apartment or a part of that overall development. A condominium, you own your unit outright and you own a defined fraction of the land underneath that thing. So that's, that's why if you hear about co-op boards, the co-op boards have to approve whoever enters that shareholder model. If you own a co condominium, you can just sell it to whoever you want. You don't have, you don't have to network with your, with your neighbors. Um, but this model also emerged in, uh, after the First World War as a third way for housing production, something that was not public housing. So it was not state-run and also not private and speculative. So the idea was to develop a sector of housing that would um, stay outside of the market um, perpetuity. So residents buy shares and pay monthly carrying charges. And um, this basic nonprofit identity of, I'm going to use some of your terms, the identity, the trust model, um, that's central to European cooperatives, was changed in... Um, was never really central to United States cooperatives, but in the Mitchell Lama Law, which you might have heard of in New York City or New York State, um, the nonprofit principle was quickly eliminated because not a lot, enough developers were picking up on this model and in the so-called exit clause. So once the state-provided mortgage was paid off, the cooperators or the owners of the development, the Mitchell Lama also funded uh, rental properties, were able to exit the price restrictions and the nonprofit models of that thing. So um, I'm interested in cooperatives because it has produced some very excellent architecture and is in a way a form of crowdsourcing for permanently affordable housing or housing that's managed at cost but not at profit, um, but that hasn't really um, proved so doable here. So just a brief historic overview, uh, 1920s Berlin. So this is a sort of a, an anti-urban settlement pattern but it's taken on many forms. Um, New York City and the Bronx, the amalgamated cooperatives is a uh, trade union uh, based housing. Um, this was pre Mitchell Lama under the New York State limited dividend law, which actually does not have an exit clause. So all of this housing is still um, affordable. Um, some of the other projects you might know, Penn South, just uh, between 8th and 9th Avenue south of Penn Station was a slum clearance project also done by the United Housing Foundation, um, that has opted to stay limited equity, so this is still nonprofit, very cheap, and the co-op city, which you might also know, was sort of the last and the largest with 15,000 apartments um, up in the northeast Bronx. Um, but the cooperative model also 
became applied in the 1970s when there were a lot of um, abandoned properties in New York City, which is hard to imagine today, but because of tax delinquency, a lot of the properties um, in Harlem, in the Bronx, in Brooklyn became city-owned, and uh, in many cases, the city transferred the ownership of the building to the tenants who were made into cooperators um, and, and partially had to invest their own uh, sweat equity. Um, and just uh, so the issue that I've brought up already, a lot of these over 100,000 units that were built since 1955 into the 70s have um, chosen to go market rate. And one of the most recent ones is Southbridge Towers, um, which is now market rate. So, okay. So, two recent examples of Zurich in terms of what's uh, possible. Zurich is in Switzerland. It's a high price city, just like New York City. Um, First one completed in 2014, mixed use, new construction on the site of a former garage for streetcars, 97 apartments for 250 people, everything from micro units to um, seven bedroom apartments, shared kitchen, bed and breakfast, retail, and also I have to say this, I think 40% office and 60% um, housing, a brief view. A strange site between two big streets and a, a train. This is while it was being completed. So here you can see the, the, the ground floor is a garage. On top of that garage uh, is, is a park and then the housing cross section. And again, there's a, all the different things that are meant to happen here concurrently. Uh, this is in construction. And here is an overview of all of these different things that happen. Um, how is this funded? Uh, to become eligible to live here, you pay a membership due. That's about 1,000 Swiss francs, which is about $1,000. So if 900 people apply, there's already sort of a pot of a million dollars. Um, once this is built, you apply. If you get in, you then make it you buy your share, so for let's say three, three or four bedroom apartments, that might be 25,000 Swiss francs, and then you pay maybe 1,800 a month. If you leave, you sell that back to the cooperative. Um, these are sort of older pictures. I'm gonna go sort of quickly. The other one I'm looking at is um, a larger new development of the whole, um, whole neighborhood of 13 buildings almost 500 apartments, and again, a very big mix of, of living forms. That's the, the urban design, realized by, the buildings were realized by five different architects, and each building had a certain idea, live work, or large, you know, large households, small households, so on. This is it finished. And just two types that are interesting. This is a, um, a cluster type. So it's basically a, a number of micro units, which is something that's much discussed in New York, but they're grouped together around a shared, um, a shared living space. Um, and these are family units. So these are much larger. Some of them have two entrances. And again, they're organized in a way that even within an apartment, you can sort of separate. You can imagine that the Grandparents live on one end, and the, the couple at the other end, and the child even somewhere else. And that's just an impression of that. So why does it work there, and why not here? In these examples in Zurich, the land is generally public, in a public ownership, and it's leased and not sold outright. So what New York City did with all that housing and real estate that it got in the 70s, New York City wanted to put it right back into private ownership as quickly as possible to get it onto the property tax roll because that's the main source of revenue. In Zurich, they're leasing it, 99-year leases, and the cooperatives that are built there, they pay a fee. It's not as they get it for free, but it's not, it's not, it doesn't have the same status as, um, as the property tax here. Housing is seen as a long-term investment, operated a cost not to make um, profit. But le well, let's go through this. I'll do the American, American ones then. Commercial lenders are on board. Actually, all the lending for these projects is absolutely simple. Straightforward banks. There's nothing, nothing uh, fancy about it. Individuals who then buy into this can actually draw on their pension funds at no penalty. So everything that you've put away already, you can use towards buying one of these units. 
and design is seen as a, as a driver of quality. Whereas in New York, again, the public lands, there's hardly anything left, but it's typically been sold. So if you're trying to do this kind of model now, you're competing against um, other people. Um, housing is seen as a main household wealth builder. So actually, this is something interesting we could discuss later. Uh, how does this in a system that prioritizes that you save for retirement by buying a home and assuming that the home will gain in value and that will be what you draw on when you need it. Um, that's not the case in, in many parts of Europe. Lenders are skeptical. Again, property taxes are the main source of municipal re revenues, disincentivizing nonprofit development, and design is sort of as a, seen as a necessary evil that just costs more and complicates everything. Um, so just a side note to two models that uh, are sort of being talked about quite a bit also in architecture schools or on the campaign trail. So what about Burlington? I mean, Vermont, uh, where Bernie Sanders used to be the mayor. Mm -hmm. And what about Berlin, which has become sort of a uh, central point for the Baugruppen. Baugruppe is a, a building group, literally the people who come together to build something. So Sanders actually introduced uh, the community land trust in Burlington, while he was mayor there in 1984, it now operates about hi, I did see <laughs> 2,000 rental apartments and 500 uh, homeownership. But the basic principle of, of a community land trust is that the ownership of the land is separated from the ownership of the buildings, meaning um, that land can be managed in some way and a cost by a group of stakeholders, and the person who buys or rents the apartment on it, again, pays a fee, sort of like a lease, but by this model, I actually haven't quite understood how it works, but in this model, you, you, can, you can keep it affordable because once the house is sold, 75% in the case of uh, Bur uh, Burlington, 75% of the sales price goes back to the land trust, and the person who sold it takes 25%. I'm assuming there are additional affordability restrictions that you cannot just sell at whatever cost you can get. Um, and again, the, the, the land trust is governed by various stakeholders, typically people who live in the buildings, people who live in the larger community, and some other experts or public official. Um, then the Baugruppe. Um, I googled Baugruppe, and this was like the second one who came up, so it's, <laughs> it's interesting that we have the same example. The Baugruppe is typically um, it's often launched by architects or smaller groups of residents who have direct say in the design. They want to decide how they want to live and they pool their resources. They can be cooperatives, they can exist on a community land trust, but they don't have to. And the typical ones that have been in the press in Berlin are organized as condominiums. And they're typically not deed restricted in any way. That means they're affordable because of the lo low cost of land that has existed there so far and they save money by eliminating the middleman, the developer, but they're not affordable in the sense of nonprofit. So the building which you saw, if one of these, uh, I don't know how many there are, 24 uh, families living in here, wants to sell, he or she can do that at whatever price they can get, nobody else has to say. So in that sense, they're not, um, they're a great tool to have a greater say as a person in how you want to live and to, to crowdsource in that sense, but they're not a, they have nothing to do with um, outsmarting the market system in that way. So uh, that was just my small uh, contribution. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for having me here. Uh, thanks to Sun for the very interesting historical context of what we're talking about today. Um, so my name is Christopher. Uh, I'm a mathematician by trade. I work as uh, developing Ethereum software, uh, but by night I'm a DIY architect, and I've also previously worked in a big uh, architecture office. And uh, I just thought I'd give like a sort of like a personal uh, journey through 
uh, architecture and the development of blockchain and the promises thereof uh, through some sort of uh, smallish projects that I've been working on. Uh, and hopefully uh, it can serve as a sort of like a down-to-earth, uh, uh, say, context for what's possible. Um, okay. So as a mathematician, you're very aware of the, the, the bond between architecture and mathematics. Uh, you can look at, you know, like historical buildings such as the pyramids using very primitive algebra to decide the form. Uh, then you have, you know, the introduction of like quadratic forms and, you know, uh, cathedrals and such. Uh, with the exponential function that came with the advent of uh, the discovery of uh, dynamical systems such as planetary movements, uh, we, 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 today we can see reflected in uh, sort of parametric architecture and biomimetics. The, third the fourth function you see here is, is, is the hashing function, which is the basic, most fundamental primitive function in cryptography and thus blockchain. Uh, I guess I'm going to try to argue that this mathematical function will also be a significant form uh, giver in, in architecture, although it's an invisible form. Uh, it's, a, it's an, uh, it's an economic, economical form. Um, can I press play here? Uh, this, uh, maybe not. Uh, when I uh, was working for Fosgrim Partners, uh, and I heard about the blockchain, I immediately sort of like, well, this is great, Pirate BNB. Uh, we have, you know, Pirate Bay, everyone loves Pirate Bay, everything's free. Uh, you have sort of like uh, autonomous organizations of dwellings, uh, and you have some kind of like Airbnb-like uh, distributed, pirated living community. And so I was quick to register this domain. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, so when you when you hear about uh, blockchain and the promise of this this kind of like libertarian utopia, uh, it's easy to sort of think of also a, a somewhat like a, a more dystopian scenario where you have a, a peer to peer economy, no one's paying taxes, everything's run by these sort of technocratic smart contracts on computers, which you don't even know where to locate anymore, but all your identity and all your money is tied into it, so you're kind of helpless could pretty much become a, a, a nightmare scenario. Uh, so I think it's important to highlight some of the, some of the uh, more uh, uh, positive aspects, because this is a pretty frightening scenario. Um, back to architecture. Um, so this, uh, the, the company I was working for, Foster & Partners, designed a sort of like a landmark building, uh, somewhat famous, it's the HSBC Bank in Hong Kong, built in 1985. This is, I think, like an architect's, you know, rendering, or probably not rendering back then. Uh, uh, big, big client, right? Like one of the largest banks in the world, and you have this kind of uh, perfect scenario, customers and tourists walking around. Uh, uh, in reality, uh, this place is kind of famous for being uh, repurposed uh, during weekends uh, when um, I think mainly Philippine uh, women uh, use the space when, uh, when it's rainy outside and they can't go back uh, to where they're uh, from their work. Uh, and there's a kind of like interesting dynamic here, I think, for the architect and the client, which are ostensibly large property owners that, you know, the, the architect is very much dictated by the client's need. On the other hand, they're trying to design for people, but they're also unable to respond to the actual needs of the people when they're uh, dwelling in their buildings. And what's less known about this is that after Occupy, where this was uh, uh, occupied with many tents, the, 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 the owner of the building actually asked Foster again to, to redesign the square very subtly, maybe introduction of one or two water features that, you know, at a given moment would all just spurt water and make it <laughs> you know, just slightly uncomfortable to remain. But of course, water evaporates and then it's back to normal. I think it also illustrates the sort of uh, predicament that the architect is in that uh, he or she is working on these grand projects, has a, larger, a lot of big ideas, but in reality most architects, and I would say maybe most individuals in today's society, is kind of like limited to creative expression on this scale. This is a Lego model of the HSBC bank. Um, so there's a real discrepancy between the, the domain of uh, architects that 
can, can move people and organize people uh, on a daily basis and what being dictated by the, the structures of uh, ownership in public space today. So one of the responses in my life to this was this um, in, in London, 2012. This is like central London. My colleague and I, we started a uh, sort of, a, what, what did I write? Let's see. Uh, an informal network grown uh, organically and bootstrapped by Airbnb. This was at the beginning of the sharing economy. Uh, we built and hosted an economical and creative shelter against the economical tidal waves that put individuals to their, um, what did I say there? Uh, that tie their, the individuals to their Lego kits at, at night and at daytime to their day jobs. So, we, so this is in the middle of gentrifying central London shortage where we uh, sort of, let's say, inhabited it in, uh, an abandoned work, uh, warehouse and tried to create a very cheap live-work scenario where we had some uh, 400 people through in one year to live and work uh, anything from one day to... I think six months was the person staying the longest. Um, uh, a, ve a very simple kind of architectural model. Uh, you're in a great space, you want a bed. That's an art crate. You, uh, that's a room. Here's some missing picture. Uh, it's a kind of like a city within a city, uh, expressing this, the, the idea of a shelter from the economical reality of the outside. Um, then comes, uh, at least in my life, the, uh, the introduction of the, or the promise of the blockchain, right? So what the, the issues you're facing as a community are often like, how do you share, uh, please remind me when time is, okay. uh, how do you share property uh, in, a, in this kind of international context where you're not, not, you're not necessarily close friends, but you still have a, a, a common goal. And the promise of the blockchain is to somehow like through software codify these ownership and stake relationships that you can have in organizations and maybe even like property. Um, so here's a project with, uh, by, by Ryan in the audience uh, called Form Space, investigating kind of like what the introduction of blockchain into architecture. This is a, it's an experiment with the, the sort of like the core upholder of the network that we've been hearing about, the miner, uh, which is powering this decentralized network that you heard about as an architectural element. So it's actually uh, the, um, heating up the space through the, the wasted energy that goes into the blockchain. Um, and so, um, let's see. I think uh, one of the aspects that's interesting with the introduction of blockchain into architecture is that from an economical point of view, um, as, as, as Mike alluded to, everything is transparent on this platform. So you have source code that's transparent. You actually get an, an economical incentive to participate in transparent structures. You could, of course, imagine like, well, okay, someone made an, a, you know, a, a decentralized or autonomous organization running on the blockchain. Why don't just someone take that, modify it to their own advantage, and then you know, make more money than the alternative that, that is open and free? Well, the problem is that they will have a, a problem getting people to join their network. So there's an interesting aspect in, in blockchainifying most anything in that it economically incentivizes transparency. Um, and I think the, the sort of the, the um, uh, what's the word, uh, potential for that uh, is yet to actually be seen. We, we have a, a natural kind of like distrust against organizations because we, you know, it's, it's rational from an economical perspective, if nothing else. Um, as a last uh, set of slides, I'm going to show uh, uh, sort of my conclusions at this or current work uh, in, in, in downtown LA. Uh, we're building a co-working space, sort of uh, inspired by the phone space idea we have, our uh, mining uh, unit supporting the Ethereum blockchain. And we are very much incentivizing participants in the space to be shareholders in the space itself. So it means that we have a token that represents uh, your, uh, you know, it could be represent something uh, monetary, such as paying the rent, but it could also represent something you contributed into the space. So automatically, by just being in the space or helping out or paying, you become a shareholder. And this is sort of like a t in total independence of your uh, original relationship to the space. So you don't have to know the owners, you don't have to sort of like um, 
be in a privileged position necessarily. Um, let's see. Um, I stopped looking at my notes. Um, So I think uh, this is a meaningless picture. Okay, that's the space. Uh, I think a point of this be in, in, in a longer term is to, to start thinking about once um, you, you have stake in most of the spaces that you're inhabiting, either from uh, dwelling in them or working in them or contributing to them, uh, the border between like work and life as we know it, which, which already is kind of dissolving, is then again being this 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 solution is being supported potentially by the tokenization of reality in this way. And the blockchain really ties in into architecture in that sense that it pr provides the, the the sort of like the virtual architecture or virtual space in which these kind of transactions take place. So. I, I guess I urge architects and, and other people interested in space to think about the blockchain as a new space to, to explore and build into. Okay, thank you. All right, so there's probably questions. If you guys want to like get wine or do whatever you want to reset, uh, we invite all the speakers up here to give questions. So think about anything you might have
and uh, they look innocent enough, but what they kind of represent implicitly is like, for all practical purposes, infinite address space. Uh, and it's, it's kind of difficult to grasp that infinity, but it's, so you, you, it's a kind of like a materialization of infinity. Uh, and so there's really like, the, you know, saying like, well, I'm just going to upload this contract like 100 million times per day through my, you know, whatever process I'm running is actually not an issue at all. That 100 million is nothing. And for all, practically any process that you can imagine, this address space will just be sort of like an ever-expanding void. Um, something to keep in mind. Yeah, your yeah, question? Yeah. Um, so I understand Bitcoin, or at least I think I do, but you know, I don't understand it when you guys take it to property. Like, like, okay, so Bitcoin works like, we all agree that Bitcoin has value and there are people who take Bitcoin to cash. But if we go to property, then like, we all agree that, let's say this room agrees that like this person owns this property and I own that property. But like, who actually owns it? Like, who do I go to to say that, like, how do we trade the property and, like, does everyone have to be included? Like, right now, the government, if I come and take the land, the government will be like, no, this is his land. But that's not a Bitcoin use. It's only takes another three, since we developed it on our own, and the government is involved. It's decentralized. But I don't think how that works with property, and, like, someone has to back it up. And, like, do we all have to agree on one thing, or can we have small communities that will share some property? Like, does this have to be all or nothing? Or how does that work when it comes to property versus cash? Mm -hmm. So, uh, one of the concepts around the blockchain that didn't come out specifically or uh, explicitly so far is the fact that for the first time we're able to create uh, digital scarcity. You know, before, before blockchain, you know, give me a song, you can copy the song, and it's really cheap to, come, to copy things digitally. With blockchain, you can actually have uh, an entity, an element on that network that is unique and scarce. Uh, that's where this concept of small property comes into play. So we can finance a co-op and say that, well, you know, every unit of shares that I purchase are represented as individual units on this blockchain. Now, that representation means nothing unless there's a group or a community that agrees to respect whatever is represented on the blockchain. So I'm building a, a, a title you know, management system on the blockchain, and my title management system is worth nothing until I can fit some, some banks or some title companies or some you know, state you know, recorders to say, hey, yeah, yeah, we're working with this company, and whatever we record on that blockchain is, is, is representative of our authoritative opinion. So I gave myself the World Trade Center on, the day on my system. Well, I don't own the World Trade Center because nobody recognizes what I, what I recorded there. But when you look at a project uh, like Mabel, uh, your project is a community. This group recognized that, hey, we're going to track our own collaboration and, and shares into this joint project that we have. We're going to track that on some distributed system and 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 even respect the contract and, and and saying this even just verbally or even more powerfully so a contract uh, it is very very much uh, legal right? you could go to a judge and explain the concept behind naval and say you know what you have this amount of obligations or responsibility or ownership into this project and, and if someone disputes it, oh, I don't care, you know, it's only on the blockchain. How do I know that you really own 20% of the co-working space or whatever? Uh, the judge will recognize what's been written, uh, as long as it's explicit somewhere, what's written on the blockchain. So the, these, these agreements are represented using scarce items of ownership or smart entities on the blockchain. And as long as the community recognizes it, or some existing authority says, yep, I'm a big bank and, and I, I agree with what's written on this blockchain and I'm going to sign that transaction or whatever, uh, then at that point we, we have more and more uh, influence or that blockchain has more and more meaning to, to, to the outside world. So I guess, yeah, well, sorry, so as a real estate lawyer, I can't help but see this primarily as a legislative problem, which may be influenced in various ways. And I was very interested by your discussion of trust because 
the whole problem with the American, American land title system is that it's it's not even a centralized system yet. It's it's pre it's before that. Like you haven't even reached that point of development in the system. So th this was already solved by the a Torrance land title system here in Australia in the 19th century, where the current problem is that if today in a, in a county registered in the US, what is registered puts people on record notice, but it isn't, it can be challenged. You can sue somebody to say, I know, the, I know you reported in the county registry that so and so gave you this piece of land, but I challenge that because there's an older document that I found there that says whatever. With, with a very simple piece of legislation, all of that can disappear, and these billions of dollars generated for title insurance companies can also disappear. If you just say, whatever is in the county register in an online database is definitive and will have an indemnity fund for people who are defrauded through the system, but otherwise, you cannot challenge it, which actually exists in some jurisdictions already. So my question actually is, do you think that um, this is sort of like a, a to use an Uber example, a situation where a technology will come along that will be so persuasive and so economically persuasive that legislators will be forced to account for it. Because there's nothing glamorous about land title uh, legislation. Nobody wants to deal with it. The UK completely modernized its land title system in 1925. Only its colonies are still using medieval law that even England doesn't use anymore. And so that there's, today, in fact, you're, you're better protected buying a tea kettle than you are buying a piece of land. In, legally speaking, there are more legal protections for the sale of goods than for the sale of land. So, do you think that this is? Do you think that blockchain will be that kind of technology that creates a market the way that Uber created a market for cars, owned by private individuals, that then forces the entire world, and especially lawmakers, to say, "Well, now we have to deal with the fact that we created an arbitrary monopoly for taxis, taxis, and we have to deal with this entirely new paradigm." I sat down with county recorders title insurance companies and, and, and financing organizations. Uh, and I think that's where the change is going to happen. The banks who uh, don't benefit from all the other middlemen that are involved in the transfer of a title, uh, they're looking for a solution. They are uh, not going to wait for legislative change because that takes too long. There's too much money involved. So the time, the risk, the fraud, obviously that, that, that's happening in a very complex system today, uh, are all driving banks to figure out a private solution to that problem. And once you see some of the largest players in the space start to adopt a new technology, maybe mine, maybe something else out there, uh, blockchain is a very, very well position to solve that problem. So the United States, which does have a very archaic system, is well positioned to actually leapfrog uh, you know, a lot of the work that's been done in the 20th century in trying to modernize tribal management. Uh, the United States is well positioned to leapfrog that, and I think you see that with the amount of interest in what's known as fintech. A lot of banks right now, every bank in New York City right now has a blockchain project of some sort, trying to figure out what can we do with this, and to the extent where real estate is a large part of their portfolio, we can be sure that they're working on trying to figure so, so this is an interesting scenario as you guys are talking there's all this uh, kind of secondary discourse happening on the screen uh, uh, is there any like uh, take out the question from the audience is there anything that someone has written on the doc or has seen on the doc that they'd like to point out uh, so that we can get that uh, as a space for questions otherwise we can ask where we go well, well you, you went ahead and made my, my question read so can you summarize yeah, well, I, I mean, I've become very interested uh, as of late in alternative definitions of architecture that I've been uh, surrounded by more and more, which uh, have always seemed to be completely uh, missing in uh, architectural discourse and in the way that I've been educated in an architecture. Um, in particular, uh, the idea of information architecture or the architecture uh, as it would be uh, defined by a computer science uh, or a, uh, a programmer, um, or practically anybody in the tech sector. Um, and it seems like a, a really important uh, realm for architects to be considering because it is uh, a, a really critical application of our, our skills as uh, designers and systems thinkers. Um, yet uh, yet I've, I've, I've never seen uh, a, a really uh, 
uh, critical uh, perspective on the abstract and uh, completely um, virtual, uh, non-physical and scaleless uh, architectures that um, that are changing the world, but are, are completely invisible. Um, and I just wonder, what, what will it take for the architectural discipline to adapt and to define itself in a way that it can address both the physical and the, the digital? Um, and, and can they do that before they're displaced or made relevant uh, by programmers? Mm -hmm. Does it comment on that? Mm -hmm. I mean, there are some so maybe I'm not that word, I think like it's called software architecture. There's like, you know, political coders out there. Like I don't think it necessarily needs to be drafted with pen and paper. And then like curi curiously there's also been historically some exchanges between, you know, uh, software engineering and architecture. You know, a lot of the paradigms uh, of, of software engineering actually then they turn terminal or borrowing terminology from the market. Uh, so I just see that that will probably just come out of the and who knows, depending on the economical, you know, how, how the future ends up, like it might be recognized as one field. But I, I, I don't see there as any like lack of it, it's not a danger. Mm -hmm. if, if anything I would say that uh, blockchain is information technology almost catching up to how we live. Right? We need centralized organizations. So we're not getting rid of those old mainframe servers yet, right? We still have client servers. So we need all models, right? Centralized, decentralized, and distributed. Uh, we live with systems like this in our day-to-day -day lives. We didn't have a good way to represent true peer-to-peer, -peer, which which is a lot of our lives. This is your friends network. This is this is how how we live, you know, most of our lives, I would argue. Uh, we didn't have a good way to represent peer-to-peer -peer relationships on a virtual platform before the event of blockchain. Now we have the ability to identify who you are. And, and by the way, just like in your real life, you can have multiple identities, right? You're someone when you're at school, you're someone else when you're at work, and when you go out to a bar, a little different too, right? So you do have multiple identities in your personal life, and on these blockchains, you can have a, you know, an infinite number of identities to everybody else out here. And I'll know your reputation, I'll know you through one of these networks, and I will respect you or that identity of you because so many other people respect you and you've transacted peer to peer. And, and that, is, that is brand new. We don't know yet where it's going to go. But in a world where the Internet of Things is starting to impact architecture, where financing you know, a, a project is still very complicated. Being able to connect with one another in a very natural way is going to be a very powerful and uh, life-changing tool. So, maybe on the point, and in regards to another question that I see up there, uh, there's reasons that the R50 bow grouping doesn't exist here. One of which is because you simply wouldn't be able to get land here. And so, are there ways this question is about convincing financiers or uh, you know, relating it to conventional structures. Are there ways that blockchain could be used to circumvent that in a productive way to enable some of these co these co cooperative models over land trusts? Could you, for instance, tokenize these, these processes? Uh, what would that look like? Yeah, so I feel like you're dating me a little bit because you talk about this a lot, but you talk to me about it. Um, so, uh, one thing that is kind of new that architects can do with blockchains is they can democratize the design process uh, because it's very cheap uh, to specify ownership in projects now. Uh, whereas today, um, you need like fancy lawyers and people have to like, you know, promise a bunch of money if things go wrong and say, okay, I'll pay you this if this happens and you pay this if this happens. Uh, you can specify with a few lines of code, um, you know, the ownership structures that previously were lawyers for. So when you sort of, when you distribute, when you democratize the design process in that way, to your point, uh, architects need to think about, they need to be careful about how they democratize and how they distribute the design process such that um, no one actor is able to monopolize the process in a way that isn't intended. So you have to sort of think about the architecture uh, of the distribution of equity in a project. Um, and you can be creative about it because it's so cheap now. Yeah. 
blockchain do for the notion of public good or public sector? Or if you got a call, call tomorrow, tomorrow from the IRS and said, yeah. can you come work for us? We need to improve our tax collection. The one thing I'll say do? then yeah. from a public perspective, probably the, one of the number one attributes of the blockchain, you mentioned that in your talk, is that it is a token metric. Everybody can see everything that's written in it. So if we finance a project, of course we can try to keep our identity secret, so there's a lot of you know, privacy and anonymity possible as well, but if we publicize, if a state entity or private entity says, hey, this is my address, and I'm going to raise funds here in order to generate you know, whatever popular project. Anybody can go monitor these addresses and, and see the, trend, the in and the outs you know, of these transactions and monitor what's going on around it. So it is a very, uh, it's at, at once very private, but it's also very open and out in the open that anybody can, can audit, if you will, that these transactions have taken place. What does that mean? Again, none of us know, right? I mean, you know, none of us are really experts. Nobody can figure out how 5, 10, 15 years that this technology will change how we contract and interact with one another. But I mean, you know, the interesting thing is the voting example, right? I mean, on this public sector or democracy, right? So, I mean, even with the state of the internet that we have today, this country could have changed the way it registers voters, how we vote, possible. But there's no, there's no will to do it. So yeah. what, how, so, why would that change with? So, so I, I think there actually are opportunities to um, use code as law more powerful than existing law. So here in New York City, um, Stytown was recently sold, and uh, the mayor made the new owner promise that they would keep some part of it affordable for 30 years or whatever. And that was just like a political decision that was made, like there were politicians who talked to the developing blah, blah, blah. But let's say that, you know, at some point in history, uh, a bunch of people got together and said, we're going to start a co-op, and this co-op is going to be affordable forever. Um, you could specify that in a smart contract and say that, so, so if you tokenize the ownership of it um, and, and distribute the equity in that way, uh, you could specify the tokens such that it's only possible to sell them to an identity uh, which you know is of a certain income level with a certain level of certainty. Um, and you could specify that such that it could never be changed no matter what. Um, so I would argue that blockchains, yeah, they do give us, give us a stronger ability than existing law potentially to encode our ideals uh, into a long facts. Are we, any questions? Uh, so, uh, yeah. Uh, there seems to be a conundrum, I guess, that you have um, a re replaced Airbnb with a blockchain because then you're going to eliminate the third party, but it's critical that you have feedback uh, between the renter and the rentee, and uh, it can't be thought of the renter because he's going to show bias towards the, uh, the good side, I guess, right? So then how are you going to have feedback with a two-party blockchain? Airbnb. Two word answer to that. <laughs> it's a long answer. Uh, reputation oracles. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oracles act as truth, and their truth is determined by the reputation. In short, many third parties. So it's, it's equally it's distributed then all over, I guess. But but what's the, what's the motivation to have feedback by the prior renters, I uh, guess? You, you could find some way to incentivize it in the contract. Like, um, it could be the case that if I have left a lot of feedback uh, on places where I have stayed and people have found my feedback useful, uh, they will then say that I am a useful you know, source for feedback and that increases my reputation. So you can put weak little incentives uh, in there which you know, have a net effect of incentivizing people Helpful things with the ecosystem. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. um, is there any preventing anyone from like buying out or increasing the, um, the size of the blockchain so that they, one entity controls like 51% of it? Uh, well, yeah, so uh, Christian and I were just talking about this earlier. I actually think that the 51% attack is an underrated threat to blockchains. Um, an actor with a lot of money, uh, like a government. 
could destroy a blockchain with a 51% attack. Uh, so I'm supposed to be up here as a blockchain advocate, and I am, but I think that the 51% attack is actually important, that's all the problem. Okay. Yeah, if you convince more than half the network that you're the source of truth and you've got something nefarious in your code. But you are the yeah. right? You can just build out the network until you have yeah, it. If you just have enough CPU network, yeah. that's all that's yeah. all it takes. That's true. That's true. And, and it's expensive. So, it's expensive. so, so if there was any to do it, right? Yeah, but, but so here's the thing. Like if you are if you are we should have like Joe Lumen up here or some economists talking about this. Uh, there there are interesting ideas about this. Like it would cost you I don't know, $600 million to destroy, to, to take over the Bitcoin blockchain. And in doing that, you would destroy all of Bitcoin's value. Uh, because as soon as the blockchain is compromised, Bitcoin has zero value. Right? It's, it's insecure. So the network would recognize your hack or your, your power, and therefore the confidence in this peer-to-peer -peer system would go down. So you would invest money just to kill it, and as soon as it's dead, your money will be worthless. Yeah, so that you would need an actor with, with motivation to spend a huge amount of money to destroy an even huge amount of money. And that's all they get out of it, is just the destruction of value. Okay. So we have a question here, we have one back, and then we'll over to Dan. So okay. mine does tell off that we just expanding the network and having enough, I guess, kind of false identities in a way to eventually control it. But coming from like the malicious side of it, how can you use this for that or to take over the currency or to do well, it? So, so what would your like? What would your motivation be in wanting to destroy Bitcoin, for example, or wanting to take over the Bitcoin network? You, your your only motivation, I think, could be to want to steal Bitcoins. But as soon as you enable yourself to do that, like people, the reason that Bitcoins have value is the same reason like a euro has value relative to a U.S. dollar. People are willing to spend U.S. dollars to buy euros. People are willing to spend U.S. dollars to buy Bitcoins. If Bitcoin is compromised, <coughs> no one's going to be willing to spend U.S. dollars to buy Bitcoin anymore, and it has no value. So, so unless you're like a madman and you just want to destroy that and you have hundreds of million bucks to do it. Or it could be like a government. So mm -hmm. say Bitcoin is transacting, maybe that's, you know, a key funding source for ISIS or for some sort of terrorist activity. That would be the reason to destroy it and only make the value because funding money drives the world as we know it. So if you cut off the funding source. I, I think the governments are correct. Okay. Okay. Yep, I think you're right. Yeah, we can we're going back, way back, and then we're done. Yeah, I, I think the whole blockchain applications are fascinating. I, I wonder about like, a couple underlying assumptions. I think one is that it represents the public. And I would question just to panelists like what that public is. Like how do we incorporate the blockchain for those who have limited access to digital societies, for those who don't have means to access computers? And I guess the second question is like if it's distributed properly, then who is it distributed to? It seems like in some ways the blockchain is enabling systems that are sort of very liberal in their economic output or economic outlook, um, but we sort of know also intuitively that those systems are not necessarily inherently equitable, and that they play in certain kinds of systems that increase disparity. Is there sort of a, a way to maybe tweak the blockchain to, to shift us back towards a position of you know, social equity? Or? There's a lot of a lot of the benefits if you look in the Bitcoin space, particularly because it is kind of the oldest blockchain out there. Uh, a lot of the benefits and interest into Bitcoin comes from the underdeveloped world. Uh, so the unbanked and people that don't have title registries, not the national record and all that. So there's a, you know, so the second and the third world, there definitely is a lot of interest in using this technology to you know, leapfrog you know, all the development that's been done here in America and Europe over the last you know, hundred years or whatnot. Uh, but at the same time, you point out very, very valid, um, I guess, weakness in the system. Uh, if you know, particularly if you're going to use it as a, a mobile type you know, uh, system where I'm walking around and I've got my assets, my smart contracts, and my bitcoins or whatever on my phone, and I want to transact with someone else. Yeah, I need network access. And to the extent where network is not available. And there's ways to mitigate that. You, know, you can sign transactions just locally on the phone until you get to your you know, home or hotel room or some you know, the post office where you might have an internet access and there you can post your transaction to the network. But then there's going to be a delay which obviously will, will impact the nature of what you can do with those kind of transactions. Uh, ubiquitous network access uh, is, is, is definitely a, a need. If you're 
when I want to do things in real time. Uh, it's also a weakness in the system. If, if the internet goes down and suddenly we're not able to communicate peer-to-peer, -to -peer, then the peer-to-peer -peer network is not very valuable anymore. Uh, those are kind of extreme scenarios. I don't see the power structure of the internet going down anytime soon, but, uh, but yeah, definitely in a peer-to-peer -peer system, we need to be able to communicate electronically with one another. Um, yes, uh, we're going to have up there right now, but um, kind of touching on what Christopher and Susanna were talking about in terms of communal interests. Um, Karen recently described to me that basically a, a CLT, a communal interest, is a mechanism to complicate the ownership of a land, a third experts, a third of a certain community, a third users of, of the land, so that in effect it's nearly impossible to sell the land at any given point. Um, so I guess in some ways it seems that like in this case the CLT, which has as motive some sort of resistance to quote uh, Christopher or some sort of permanent affordability, requires explicitly to kind of halt or slow down market activity or the buying and selling of land per se. But um, you know, this kind of blockchain technologies with real estate have at their focus sure transparency or sure kind of a, kind of a, trust, a, a lack of even trustlessness. But I'm curious if there's any provisions for slowing down contracts. Like, in other words, isn't the technology focused on how to make contracts more rapid, more just less, requiring less trust? Doesn't that actually um, induce more activity? And is there kind of some sort of uh, meta check on how to make contracts that stop contracts from happening? Is there a contract that says, just with this contract, we will not make any contracts for 100 years if they send more How many people were going to think of things that none of us have thought about? Yeah, I could answer that. But so, what worries me, so the short answer is yes, you can do that. The problem that I'm thinking about, and I don't really understand, is the sort of like, total unleash of free market forces on the blockchain. Uh, it's, it's kind of like unprecedented. Uh, in like financial terms, we're talking about like zero transaction costs, right? Like it, it literally costs nothing to engage in these markets. And I just don't, I don't, I don't I do not only mean like monetarily, but like in time, investment, in privilege, and so on. And so even if you imagine the land trust where you can very easily look at like, I'm not going to this contract is not active until 50 years from now and all those things, you're also dealing seemingly, and I'm not sure about this, on a, on a market where participants of the blockchain, and we're talking individuals, we're talking about corporations, we're talking about other machines, all engaging together, they need to be financially incentivized to prefer those contracts over one where that rule is not in place. This is just basic market uh, economy, right? And it's, it's unclear to me like why a priori that would be enforced. So even if you create a whole beautiful system with you know, uh, all these the retardation built in for whatever purposes, it will only be valid if people recognize it to be valid. And for example, in their contracts then that build upon land ownership, say, oh, we only we are only going to recognize land ownership from contracts which have this retardation claim. Right? It's like a cascading effect of, 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 the, of reputation. Um, and what's really unknown to me, I don't, don't know if anyone has an answer, is like, well, what's going to be preferred? Like, how, what's the selection mechanism over this like, potentially infinite space of legal and social contracts? Because we're really talking, we're not only talking about people designing programs for specific purposes, but Instantly, since all the software will be available, they'll be flown, they'll be modified, we'll see genetic algorithms on contracts. They'll be, and through the interaction of machines and individuals and corporations, being able to smart contracts actually engage in financial activity, we have essentially like a, a um, like you know, in, in, in uh, genetics, you have an environment that, punish, that punishes certain individuals and uh, lets other ones appropriate. And so we're looking at a really new kind of ecosystem. And the dynamics of this ecosystem, I don't, I don't understand them. I, I, I would say people <laughs> respond to incentives. Right? I do something because something. Uh, so if you write a, a contract that is not attractive to me, or you know, not, does not benefit me in any way, I'm just not going to deal with it. Right? 
All, all, all blockchain, I think, can help. A blockchain is going to tell you what contract you write or not. You write whatever smart contract you want. And I think what blockchain can help us, however, do is avoid these scenarios like in your slide where a building was built for a purpose and then used for something totally different, right? The, 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 the will of the individuals who actually are using the building, obviously, what was missed, right? So I think blockchain will help us democratize, just like the web did, you know, you know help us democratize opinion and sharing of opinion with one another. I think blockchain will bring that to financial and, and many other transactions where at least your will, whether you engage in a contract with me or with him or whatever is most beneficial to you individually, your will will be more easily represented or, or acted upon into a system that is, you know, that has a higher level of democracy, if you want to call it that, like blockchain. It's not guaranteeing that there's good or bad contract. There will be all sorts of nefarious things on blockchain too. But you know, you can only engage or you can you decide what you want to engage with in a peer-to-peer system. For now. Well, one, one of the conversations. <laughs> Until it gets centralized, right? That's what no. you're saying. No. Until it gets integrated in a, in a fashion that we can't really envision. I think we are like sort of like recreating traditional systems. Right now, and we're like putting, like sprinkling some big joking consensus, consensus, like oh, let's sprinkle some blockchain on it. <laughs> that's all time to do. But I think for you know, especially since your question relates to 50 years in the future, I think like at least I think it's very good. Well, I, I had an interesting conversation with uh, Neuron recently, who is a guy who works at Consensus, and he has this idea that people will be able to um, sort of passively incentivize the behavior of the rest of the economy by choosing or deciding what to them money is and what money has what value. So because with any given denomination of a currency on a blockchain, we can see its entire history back to when it was first mined. Uh, you can say, okay, uh, tokens which have been used, tokens or, or uh, currencies which have been used in such a way, I'm just not going to accept that these are money, because using money in this way defies my values. Similarly, you could say tokens which have been used in this other way, uh, you know, this, this is worth double what it otherwise would be to me, because this is very much in alignment with my value. So I thought that was an interesting idea about how people could sort of passively uh, vote, if you will, on, on how other people should behave. So if you have time for two more questions. Uh, we, we talked about the democratization Yeah, that's totally uncharted territory, actually. <laughs> yeah. like, nobody knows what's going to happen when there is a single global currency. It's worth noting that we can, we can like, just rebuild the world that we have today exactly on blockchain. Um, we probably won't choose to do that. And yeah, I don't know. That would be a good idea. Yeah, last, last question. Anybody like that?
that <coughs> create disparity in between people who can actually write code and utilize blockchain in a way that a lay person can't. And finally, if you think that blockchain being adopted universally will require something like a universal basic income to actually have. Uh, I'll let the best code answer that question. <laughs> <laughs>
obviously lots of interesting questions. Thank you guys for coming. Thanks. Thank you.